<laughs> even to get here. So uh, it is great to be here at the Carter Center. And on the show tonight, I had the pleasure of uh, updating the viewers about uh, President Carter getting out of the hospital. And uh, that is great news uh, to hear about the former president on the mend, hopefully, uh, after his fall. Uh, I said Atlanta was home. I went to Marist School. I grew up in Dunwoody. Uh, so I, um, this is a bit of home away from home. I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about uh, the book and about my process of, of writing, of uh, doing this, and then uh, talk a little bit about the time that Three Days at the Brink uh, takes place and some of the interesting uh, back and forth that uh, we uncovered in this process, and then open it up for questions, if you have any, um, about <coughs> the book or, or anything you'd like. Uh, so I started this whole endeavor with uh, my first book in this presidential series, Three Days in January, Dwight Eisenhower's Final Mission. And it was about the last three days of the Eisenhower administration uh, before Kennedy is inaugurated. And I, the reason that happened was I, I'm a golfer, I'm a, I played golf in college, and uh, I'm a three handicap, but I'm a, I'm a giving three. I'm a walking wallet, essentially. Um, but I had the, the good fortune of being invited to Augusta National uh, to play. And um, I got there and they put me up in the Eisenhower cabin. And I was very, very excited about that moment. Uh, and couldn't go to sleep, I was all jacked up and I poured myself a glass of wine, or a couple of them, and walked around the Eisenhower cabin and looked at all this memorabilia and realized that I didn't know President Eisenhower, even though I cover Washington. I knew General Eisenhower, uh, but I didn't know the president. So I, I decided after that trip that I was gonna to go to the Presidential Library in Abilene, Kansas, and I did. And I went there, and it's a wonderful place if you haven't been there. Um, and I asked them, you know, I want to do something about President Eisenhower. What is, he's, so many books have been written about him. What's something that I could tap into? And they said the last three days and his farewell address, everybody thinks about it, is the military industrial complex speech. But actually there's a lot in that speech. He was by far the most bipartisan president uh, we've had in recent history. So I started this process, it took three years uh, and then I came up with this idea to have a soda straw look at this moment and really focus on that narrative and then jump back and show how the leader gets to that moment uh, in life. That was a big success. Uh, and I then decided I was going to go search for my next three days moment. The process, uh, I was really blessed to find some amazing people to work with. Uh, I found a researcher in Abilene, Kansas called Sydney Soderbergh. She was a, uh, a former mayor of Salina, this small town right next door to Abilene. And there's a lot of small towns. Abilene's not a big, bustling metropolitan. Um, so she was the former mayor, but she's a researcher at the library. And uh, I met her, and I said, I'd love to do this project. And she said, I, I think this would be great. She said, I, I have to tell you something. I said, okay. She said, you know, I watch your show, and I really like it. And I said, that's fantastic, great. She said, but I have to tell you that I am the bluest of blue Democrats. I mean, I bleed Kansas blue in Democrats. And I said, that's fantastic. I'm a newsman and an aspiring reporter of history. Let's make this thing happen. So we struck this deal. It all worked in the first book. Then I sent Sidney Soderbergh to Simi Valley, California, to hunt for the next three days moment, uh, because I thought Ronald Reagan was another consequential figure in American history. Um, I can remember Reagan, and I had an interaction that I could go back to uh, meeting him. Uh, so I went, and we found out that this moment in Moscow where he delivers a speech to Moscow State University students uh, was largely uncovered in history, but was a consequential moment for the scope of ending the Cold War. So that became those three days at the Moscow summit between Reagan and Gorbachev become the focus of that 
second book, Three Days in Moscow, Ronald Reagan and the Fall of the Soviet Empire. Um, that made it to number one, and I figured there's gotta be one more three days in me. Uh, and like the Star Wars movies, I decided that the next version should go back to the beginning and the prelude of how the Cold War starts. So the Eisenhower book is in the middle of the Cold War when he's really battling uh, the Soviets. Uh, and Reagan is the end of the Cold War with the uh, diplomatic dance he does with Gorbachev. Three Days at the Brick is the beginning of the Cold War, but it's also the end of World War II. And how that is all intertwined is became really fascinating. So moved Cindy Soderbergh to Hyde Park, New York. Uh, also London, the Churchill uh, Library and the notes. Uh, and we actually had documents from Stalin uh, in, in Moscow. Uh, my partner in crime is Catherine Whitney, who is a, an amazing person who uh, changed her schedule. She's a morning person, but I write at night. So we real time go back and forth like a ping pong match with paragraphs and chapters, and she then stays up with me when I'm uh, when I'm writing, and we we get the um, pieces, the nuggets that Sydney has uncovered, this kind of treasure trove in our national archives. You don't really fully appreciate how much is here uh, in all of the presidential libraries, but there are so many nuggets that are uncovered and not even out there about our own past uh, that you just have to dig and find them. So she would provide these and then we would arrange them sort of like a quilt, you know, pieces of a quilt and put the story together and then bounce back and forth. That's the process. Because I always get asked those questions. Why do you do this? You don't have enough to do? And um, I do actually. I do have a lot to do. I always say I'm one tweet away from changing my entire show, uh, <laughs> which we did tonight too. Uh, and then how do you do it? And that's, I'm sharing the process of, of how it gets done. Uh, I also don't sleep a lot, as my wife Amy can attest. Uh, a lot of caffeine and the occasional glass of red wine. Uh, so let me give you the elevator pitch of this story and why I was so intrigued by it. These three leaders, the big three, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin, meet for the first time in Tehran, November of 1943. The at the brink part of this book is that we forget that the world was at the brink. The Allies could have lost World War II. It was actually going south in a number of aspects. Hitler was on the march through Europe, uh, we had had some small wins in the Pacific against the Japanese, but that also was teetering, and they needed to change the dynamic. Nazi, uh, Hitler and the Nazis had invaded the Soviet Union and had a massive battle in Stalingrad where millions died, uh, and the Red Army really took, took it on the chin as far as casualties, uh, but they ended up winning that battle. Had it not been for that, Stalin may have chosen to side with Hitler in the dynamic of, of leadership at that time. And that's what FDR and Churchill are worried about, is that they have to get Stalin one-on-one -on -one to make sure that he's going to become a legitimate ally to get the Red Army involved in the war, and ideally FDR would like him to help in the Pacific against the Japanese. Uh, so they strategize about how to do this. FDR and Churchill had a great relationship, uh, strained at times because Churchill tried for a very long time to get FDR to come into the war. Remember that Great Britain was alone in fighting World War II, fighting the Nazis, uh, and dealt with the bombing in London. Uh, if you've ever seen that movie um, with uh, Gary Oldman, the, the one that got the Academy Award, Darkest Hour, fantastic and from everything we've read, fairly historically accurate. Churchill is battling, trying to get the US to get help, to help. And um, Congress had passed a law that prevented our country from getting involved after World War I. So FDR feels like his hands are tied. He continues to talk to Churchill and write letters and, and meet, uh, but he is not engaged in getting into the war. 
That all changes, obviously, December 7, 1941, when Pearl Harbor happens. Uh, and the speech that FDR gives, a day that would live in infamy, um, it, it changes everything. And Churchill has been waiting for this moment, not to see American lives lost, but to see the, the country engaged in the war that he was trying to get them uh, into to help Great Britain. He writes numerous times, Churchill does, that he feels like a jilted lover uh, trying to get FDR to the table. But they, they had this relationship. And he comes, to, um, he comes to the White House in the winter of 1941. And you know he's a larger than life figure. Um, they're talking about the need to meet with Stalin. And Churchill is very reticent. Um, to, to bring him into the fold, because he's obviously an authoritarian dictator who's killed millions of his own people. FDR knows that as well. But Churchill says, in his own way, no one can tell me that there's anyone else who's been more tough on communism over the last 24, five years than I have. However, if Hitler invaded the gates of hell, I would have to at least say something nice about the devil on the House of Commons. Well, I don't get to do the accent on the show that much, so um, I've got a couple more accents for you. My Trump is, is pretty good. Um, <laughs> um, so he, they know that Stalin is a bad character, but they also know that, that they need to hold the hand of the devil uh, to be able to break the back of Adolf Hitler. In that meeting in the White House, and these are some of the nuggets that you you get in this book. It's a it's a narrative, just like the other books. It's it's um, very readable, not like a history book. It's a it, you can kind of speed through it, but it's the nuggets it's that that bring it to life. It brings it to uh, breathes into history. In that meeting in the White House in 1941. Uh, FDR, he, his classic drink is a stiff martini, uh, gin martini, he, he's drinking that. Uh, Churchill is drinking scotch, and they're out on the South Portico overlooking Washington, D.C. He's, Churchill is smoking cigars. They're talking late, late into the night about ending the war. And FDR's focus is also on the post-war, what that would look like. He wants to get a organization of countries that could come together and fight fascism. And he and Churchill are, are bouncing around ideas of what to call it. And they, they're going back and forth, back and forth. They finally go to their rooms in the White House and FDR rolls down the hall in his wheelchair, he's obviously in the wheelchair. He bursts into Churchill's room and he says, Winston, Winston, I've got it, I've got it. We're going to call it the United Nations, the United Nations. And at the time, Churchill has just taken a shower and he comes out stark naked, dripping wet in the room. And FDR's profusely apologizing, I'm so sorry, I, I'm so, so very sorry. And Churchill says, as you can see, it's obviously clear, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. <laughs> Dripping wet in the room inside of the United Nations with one of them naked. Um, after that, uh, they, they go forward with this meeting in Tehran. Uh, the reason it's in Tehran is that Stalin picks the place. They go back and forth in cables and telegrams and say, you know, it's really not easy for us as the leaders of constitutional and parliamentary governments to break away from our countries that far over the mountains in Iran, uh, you have it a little easier. You're a not so benevolent dictator. Um, but Stalin says, if it doesn't happen there, it's not happening. So they finally agree. Now, understand that the war is going on and it is very, very dangerous. Uh, there are U-boats all over the place, even close to the US, uh, submarines, Nazi submarines. And uh, so they try to make this meeting secret, at least at the beginning. 
So the FDR tells his aides, even, uh, not his closest aide, Harry Hopkins, but the other aides, that he's going on a presidential fishing trip and he sneaks away to the presidential yacht, the Potomac, and they sail out and meet up with the newest battleship in the U.S. Navy, the USS Iowa, and a number of other ships, destroyer, a frigate. Uh, he is on the Potomac, this, this yacht, and they get this uh, kind of lift, elevator, to take him in his wheelchair and lift him up onto the USS Iowa. The Iowa has been adjusted. Uh, they've adjusted the, the birthing place, the, the cabin, uh, so there's a, it's wheelchair accessible, and uh, they've changed the bathroom, so he has a tub that uh, he's able to, to use. I mean, very comfortable. He has all the Joint Chiefs of Staff, his military advisors, his key aides. Uh, General George Marshall is on board there, uh, and others. So they set out, and I mean, think about this. They are now going across the ocean to a meeting in Tehran. This is like the Air Force One of the day, but it's a battleship. Uh, they don't encounter any German U-boats, but they are doing a naval exercise. The Navy wants to show the President of the United States um, you know, how the maneuvers would work if they were coming under attack from submarines. So they do this exercise. Uh, FDR is out on the veranda, the porch, overlooking uh, the water. He loved being out in the water. He grew up sailing and uh, was actually the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for some time and loved being on the water. So this was really what he felt most comfortable at. Uh, during the exercise, the next ship, the USS uh, William S. Porter, uh, a Navy destroyer, is doing the exercise, but they have accidentally left a firing mechanism in one of the torpedoes, and it actually fires at the USS Iowa. And they all break silence as this torpedo, which is only about 300 yards away, starts going towards the USS Iowa. The captain of the Iowa says, this is not a drill, and he turns the Iowa towards the torpedo, and it barely misses the bow of the ship, and it explodes about 1,000 feet away from the USS Iowa. FDR sees this, and he's applauding. Oh, jolly good, that's good. <laughs> The people on deck are just one-faced because that accident could have brought down the 32nd President of the United States and his entire Joint Chiefs of Staff, including George Marshall. If that had happened, I might be delivering this speech in German uh, because it would have changed the course of the war. Uh, that's something you don't hear about. I mean, I studied World War II in, in college. I never heard about that incident. So I like to think that I'm breaking news about World War II in this book. You know, it's a Fox News alert. <laughs> they make it over to, uh, to Tehran, and there is a, the Soviets say they have picked up intelligence about an assassination attempt, that the Nazis are parachuting in a number of assassins dressed as Red Army soldiers to try to kill, um, to try to kill the big three. So for that point, the Soviets want all of the leaders to come to the Soviet embassy and be in one place. Um, Churchill is really skeptical. He thinks it's a bunch of bull, that there is no assassination attempt. FDR and his people believe that there is, so they all decide uh, to move the, the conference there. Uh, from the US embassy, they have this giant motorcade and as somebody that's uh, uh, dressed and looks like FDR in the back of the car going this way, and FDR then sneaks away in one car uh, to the Soviet embassy. Same happens for Churchill, and they all end up there. Now, the U.S. at the time, all of the aides know that the Soviet embassy is bugged. Every room is bugged. They know this because every time they say something even remotely secret, suddenly somebody pops up. Is everything okay? And then, you know, pops up, and Stalin pops up just out of the blue numerous times. Um, FDR says that he is, you know, he's a short guy, he's about 5'5", five five, uh, but he's wearing a military uniform. 
He says he has icy, cold, blue eyes. And FDR writes in his diary that he's a man strewn from granite. And um, he says he's a, a firm, firm leader who you don't want to be on the other side of. He pops up numerous times, and all the people working in the, the embassy, in the residence, the maids, the butlers, they're all dressed, but they have giant um, bulges on the side of their uniforms where the Lugers that they're holding, and it's all secret police people. Uh, the, the conference starts, and the main objective is to get Stalin to feel comfortable that he's not getting ganged up on. To do this, FDR believes that he's got to throw Churchill under the bus numerous times. And a couple of times they go to dinner, and, and FDR says, Winston, I'll hope, I hope you'll forgive what I'm about to do. And he goes in and essentially rips on Churchill for the entire time. Uh, and Stalin and FDR laugh it up, and uh, Churchill, is, steam is coming out of his ears uh, as he's getting made fun of. Churchill is an emotional guy. Uh, by all accounts of his aides and, and people who were with him, he cried once a day about something. Uh, he was very, very animate, animated when he spoke, uh, as you can see from some of those speeches that he gives on the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, but he also gets jealous of the relationship in this conference between FDR and Stalin, even though he knows that's the plan going in. Uh, but it's evident that it, he really gets ticked off by it. But the end of the conference ends up with what they want. Uh, Stalin agrees that he is going to sign on if the Allies agree to a cross-channel invasion of Normandy. In this meeting, they plan Operation Overlord, which we now know as D-Day. Uh, had it not been for this meeting, they likely wouldn't have done it. They wouldn't have done it then, at least. Churchill wanted to go through the Mediterranean first, uh, and they decide it is time. We're going to do it. And they come to that conclusion, and they sign a pact. Stalin wants another front so that he can relieve his soldiers, and uh, FDR and Churchill agree to do it. Now, that's the biggest logistical battle we have ever seen in the history of the world. And if you've ever been to the Normandy beaches, and if you don't, haven't been, I recommend you go. It's a very emotional uh, journey to see the spot where 10,000 of our soldiers uh, died on those beaches. In fact, in the, um, and there's a big section of the book about, about, about D-Day, and, and fortunately we talked to a number of 94, 95 year old veterans who actually were on those beaches. Um, who tell their stories. But at the beginning of the book, uh, the dedication is uh, to the veterans of World War II and D-Day who died on the beaches of Normandy and to those who are still living today. Thank you for your service, your sacrifice, and for saving the world. Um, he, FDR, chooses Dwight Eisenhower as the commanding general uh, for this operation. Eisenhower was not the, the pick that everybody thought he was going to choose, but he was the guy that could handle all the big egos, uh, Montgomery, uh, De Gaulle, all of these people that he had to deal with, um, and FDR makes that choice. That, they have a special relationship, which I learned about in the, the Eisenhower research and book. Uh, the issue is, is that they do give concessions to Stalin in Tehran. He's talking about Poland and whether he's, he's going to go into Poland. Churchill is, is very skeptical, thinks that he has a grand scheme, a grand plan, Stalin does, in Churchill's mind. Um, but they go forward, and they obviously have a victory on D-Day, and it changes the world. At Yalta, which is later and even further away, it takes a, a lot to get to Yalta. In fact, a five-hour open jeep ride over the mountains. Um, FDR is ill after coming back from Tehran, but Yalta actually kills him. Uh, it's the thing to put him over the top. They give even more concessions as they're planning a post-war United Nations uh, at Yalta. And after the research, it, it seems like FDR 
uh, believes that he has the ability to himself control, corral, contain Stalin and his ambitions that communism spreads. He gets home from Yalta and a few weeks later dies, uh, April 12th, 1945. He hasn't brought anybody in the US really into the circle of friendship about his thoughts about how to contain Stalin. Truman is the vice president. He's really out of the loop. He doesn't even know about the Manhattan Project and the atomic bombs that eventually he would use to end the war uh, by dropping them, two of them in Japan. So after that, Stalin then is emboldened and he moves into Poland and he starts spreading communism throughout Eastern Europe and that is the beginning of the Cold War. So you look back at that moment, um, Churchill soon thereafter loses an election uh, and the big three leaders who actually won the war uh, lost the peace and Stalin's ambitions for communism in Eastern Europe begin and that's the beginning of the Cold War. So that's how all of this is intertwined uh, about the meeting. But I, in the book, I go back to the beginning and FDR's growing up and, and um, explain the man. He was tremendously, tremendously gifted. He had a lot of uh, charisma, he was an attractive guy, he was, uh, had uh, communications abilities, he didn't want for anything because he came from a very wealthy family in Hyde Park, New York. Uh, only child, he was the apple of his mother Sarah's eye. Um, and he went into politics and he was just an average kind of vanilla politician. He could speak well, looked good, but didn't really connect. Uh, had minor success, but not, not anything big. But when he's 39, he is stricken, stricken by polio, and he loses the use of, of both legs. He would never walk again, although he would never stop trying to walk. Uh, he would get metal braces and try to physically move down the driveway at Hyde Park, uh, often falling down. When he gave speeches, he would hold his son James' arm to stand up, and James writes that he had giant welts and scratches on his arm where his father would prop himself up uh, so that he could deliver, spe deliver speeches standing up. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, the great historian, FDR biographer, said that this crucible of going through polio and losing his ability to walk made FDR an amazing leader because it gave him the gifts of empathy, of, of connection, of the ability to understand people's problems. Uh, George Will, columnist, wrote that uh, as the irons were clamped on his legs with the metal braces, uh, steel infused into his soul. Uh, he became the man, the leader that he is because of that crucible. Each one of these leaders that I wrote about, Eisenhower came from very, very humble beginnings in Abilene, Kansas, uh, lost a brother. Um, Reagan also came from a poor family, uh, an alcoholic father, and um, all of them had some kind of trouble to go through uh, to become the leaders that they, that they were. Also in the book are you know little anecdotes that I don't think you'll hear before. Uh, the relationship between FDR and then Eleanor Roosevelt uh, is very complex. Uh, they love each other at the beginning. I think they love each other throughout, but it becomes a, uh, a marriage of uh, mutual agreement. And by the time he gets to the White House, uh, she is seeking independence as a first lady and she finds it. She comes into her own as uh, bouncing around the country, going to different places to identify and help uh, poor people around the country as well as uh, all these different places, um, working camps, homeless shelters, prisons. Uh, she does it by herself. She does not want Secret Service with her. And the Secret Service says, Madam uh, First Lady, you have to have someone from the Secret Service with you. And she said, no, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, if you're not going to do it, you have to carry a gun. 
So Eleanor Roosevelt then took shooting lessons and they gave her a pistol, which she kept in the glove compartment of her car as she drove around the Northeast. Uh, she is the first and last first lady to be pistol packing. Uh, <laughs> almost positive of that. I think that's not fake news. Um, <laughs> She also went to all of these places, and, and sometimes uh, FDR didn't know. And one day he calls her assistant and says, uh, I'm trying to get Eleanor. Where is Eleanor? And, and the assistant says, well, she's in prison. And he says, well, that's not a surprise, but what's she in there for? <laughs> and he had a great sense of humor and loved uh, joking around. You know, the other thing I learned about these leaders is, you know, we look back at them as superhuman. Uh, but they're all, they were all flawed, they were all humans. And we look back at the, uh, at the image of FDR in that, in that convertible, that Phaeton, Ford Phaeton convertible with the, the cigarette and the jaunty look. Uh, he loved driving and he had that car specifically made uh, for him. And he tooled around uh, Hyde Park uh, going at breakneck speeds he, uh, as he's president, they invite uh, the king and queen from England in 1939, King George V and Queen Elizabeth. His mother's still alive at this point, and uh, she is ecstatic at, that the royalty is coming to, to Hyde Park, uh, first visit to the United States. And he takes them around in the convertible, and he's going about 70 around these terms with the queen and king. And uh, she gets out of the car and says, well, I will never do that again. <laughs> um, in that car, he had uh, a special button that he would push and a lit cigarette would come out. It was like a James Bond car, um, specifically made for him. In that uh, visit, uh, Sarah, his mother, was, was appalled when FDR uh, sets out cocktail glasses, his traditional martini, and one for the king. And she comes in and says, no, 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 they will like tea. I'm sure they will like tea. And so the king comes in and FDR says, my mother thinks you would prefer tea. And the king replied, that's what my mother, Queen Mary, would say too. <laughs> and they both drank a cold martini. They take them up to uh, Top Cottage, which is this uh, little getaway at the top of Hyde Park that they that the Roosevelts built. And it's kind of rustic, but it's, uh, it's beautiful, and it's still there today. Uh, you sit up and look over uh, the valley, and they bring up uh, the king and queen for a uh, picnic. And he serves, FDR serves, hot dogs. It's the first hot dog that the king and queen had ever had. And uh, Sarah, his mother, is appalled that they're eating hot dogs at Top Cottage. And uh, they had, had never had hot dogs before. And the New York Times headline the next day says, King tries hot dog, asks for two more. <laughs> Breaking news in those days. I like to go through uh, what, how each of these leaders deals with, uh, deals with the press. The first, you know, Eisenhower held the first press conference on TV. Uh, he was the first on the record press conference, actually, as hard as that is to believe, Eisenhower was. Uh, FDR started with uh, a good relationship with the press. He brought them in for the first time. They all came into the Oval Office. And then they were quickly told that all of this is off the record, which as a reporter is not very helpful as you're doing your, your job. Uh, he had a press secretary that was, was really tough, but twice a week he brought everybody into the Oval Office. And sometimes they would ask questions like, how was your first week sleeping in the White House? And he said, you know, I didn't sleep that well, but that's off the record. You know, so it was very jolted. He, his honeymoon with the press, though, didn't last long. He had uh, a couple of reporters particularly who really challenged him, and he, one was from the Chicago Tribune, and he was infuriated on the reporting by that newspaper. Uh, he said they were printing lies and propaganda. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, 
where, where the president is uh, <laughs> very upset about the news media. Uh, he was so mad about this particular Chicago Tri Tribune reporter that he one time asked a question and he gives him a dunce cap, a dunce hat, and puts him in the corner. That's where that comes from, the, the dunce cap and the stand in the corner. That's him with the Chicago Tribune reporter. I mean, I didn't know that. He starts um, a fireside chats over the radio and he, his effort is to get around the Washington press and to speak directly with the American people. That was his Twitter account, I think, <laughs> uh, in those days. Uh, other just really great nuggets about, uh, about FDR is that he, he's got this ability to connect with people um, that he believes himself he can move. He can, he can move the people uh, to his will. Uh, and that's what this conference is about, is the diplomacy of getting Stalin on board and making sure the Allies can, can win. And we was all in doubt. I come to the conclusion that uh, Eisenhower, FDR, Reagan, uh, all were big into talking, even if it's with an uh, authoritarian dictator. Talking is better than not talking. Um, President Carter had um, equal ability on the diplomatic front. Uh, at the Tehran conference, FDR is, is kind of a wrangler of trying to get Stalin and Churchill to agree on this next strategy to shape the war. But, but Carter, and I end with this, had his own experience as this high-level mediator between uh, opposing sides at Camp David in the summit of 1978 between Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. And when talks start to break down early in that meeting, uh, the conference, the two men, separate leaders, hunkered down in their cabins at Camp David. And Carter then shuffles in between the two cabins, trying to get a deal uh, to happen, trying to negotiate with each man separately. And he refused, Carter refuses to give up. Um, he, he says, He's going to keep on trying to get through this insurmountable impasse between the, the two days before they began. Begin was refusing to, to sign this agreement. Sadat was threatening to leave Camp David. Uh, photogra photographs were taken earlier of the three of them that were really a momentous occasion that were already out there. Uh, and Begin at one point asked Carter if he could sign the photographs and autograph them for his grandchildren early in the process. Then the whole thing starts to fall apart. Now, uh, during this time, Carter asks his secretary to get the children's names, Begin's children's names, so he can personalize the autographs of the, photo, of the photos. So Carter takes the photos to Begin in his cabin, and uh, Begin looks at them and starts to tear up because he was surprised to see the names of his children signed by the President of the United States on these pictures that had, he had said at the beginning of this conference. Uh, and thinking about uh, his grandchildren made an impression on Begin. And hours later, he told Carter he would sign the agreement, thinking about the future of his children and grandchildren. Um, so I guess I end with this, because Carter understood that that negotiating for peace was not an abstract policy matter. It was about the lives of future generations and uh, the sons and daughters and grandchildren beyond those who were negotiating. So in Begin's Camp David a cabin that day, they were not two leaders, they were two fathers talking about what was next for the future of the world and um, wanting to make sure the world was safe for them. Leaders have their moments. Uh, I'm just a reporter of history, and in this book, I'm trying to report it. Uh, and I think of the three books in this series, this is the biggest, and I hope the best. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. At the same time that this came out, a young reader's edition of the same book came out. Um, my sons are 12 and 9, and I hope they're reading this. I think they're reading this. Um, I know they can read it. And I, I really think it's important in our day and age that uh, civics makes a comeback uh, in our schools, in our life, uh, because we can learn from history. 
Uh, we've been there before, and we may be there again. And it's really important that our kids understand that most of all. So with that, I'd love to take any questions you have. I think we have some already, right? Well, thank you for 